I'm Alan Wardus, and you're listening to Think Radio. I don't think about cancer when I go to work. I think about the people that have cancer or are affected by cancer or the students whose parents have cancer, and they inspire me. That's Darcy Perkins, Executive Director of Living Journeys, a full-spectrum support group for anyone working their way through a cancer diagnosis. It's a great conversation about an important topic on this episode of Think Radio. Think Radio is supported by the Gunnison Country Times, Gunnison's locally owned hometown newspaper, and by listeners like you. To find out how you can become a Think Radio supporter, visit kbut.org. Darcy, thanks for joining me today. Thank you for having me. In preparing for today's show, it really occurred to me that you have got an incredibly difficult task that you've set out for yourself for lots of reasons. But one of the most important, I think, is that you are trying to bring a subject into public consciousness that nobody wants to talk about. Your whole organization is built around a word that no one wants to hear cancer. How in the world do you get up in the morning and steel yourself to go out and try to do this good thing in the community, knowing that people don't want to talk to you about this? Well, I think the answer to that is what I do is not about cancer. What I do is about the people who are affected by cancer. And so I can talk all day long about the inspirations I get from people who are fighting cancer. They inspire me. I can tell you about the struggles that people face and why as a community we have to take care of each other. Um, And it's really not about cancer. It's about people and lives and stories. And I don't think about cancer when I go to work. I think about the people that have cancer or are affected by cancer or the students whose parents have cancer, and they inspire me. I like your approach. And yet still, Mm -hmm. for a minute, let's talk a little bit about cancer. Sure. As we've said, it's a word nobody wants to hear. But I wonder, in your experience, is it a word that people even understand? We, We say the word cancer and we think we know what we're talking about. What is this thing that has beset our society? Well, that's a good question, and I would say that we probably think we know what that word means, but even doctors don't know what that word means. We're learning more and more about it every day. Um, Treatments are changing. Um, There are hundreds of different types of cancer, so when you say you have cancer, that can mean a lot of different things. Um, Different types of cancer have different treatments, different outcomes, um, different side effects. So the word cancer is one word that describes a whole vast array of diseases that affect different parts of our bodies. So that word cancer is often misunderstood. Sure. And and certainly on an individual level, you're saying, you know, I, the phrase I have cancer is not a one size fits all sort right. of thing. I can mean everything from, well, really, really scary mm-hmm. to, okay, we'll deal with this. Mm-hmm. Your work at Living Journeys is also dealing with cancer on a community level. Mm -hmm. What does that word mean to a community? You know, when somebody in our community is affected by cancer, uh, we're such a small community that seven degrees of separation is the motto for the world. Well, here, if you don't know the person who's diagnosed with cancer, you definitely know somebody who does. And so when one person's affected by cancer, we all are. And so describe that in detail. How does that work? How is it that I'm affected by someone else's cancer diagnosis? That's a good question. So if you have a friend who's affected by cancer, um, you have to watch them go through the journey of cancer. And that's not always pleasant. Um, They need help. They need support. Sometimes they can't work. They don't aren't able to care for themselves, if they don't have significant others or family members, if they're young, and we have a lot of young people, 
We create meal trains and um, it puts a stress on their network of friends. Emotionally, cancer is very difficult. You said, you know, well, cancer can be scary or sometimes, you know, oh, we'll just get through this. 100% of the time when you hear the words, you have cancer, it is scary. No doubt. No doubt. So, you know, it goes beyond just friends and family because at some point, um, friends and family, their resources are exhausted. Um, I had cancer. I'm cured. It's a curable form of cancer. But the first six months, I had family and friends rallying around me, no doubt. But it took me many years to become whole again and to feel the energy I needed to take care of my kids. And probably psychologically safe. Again. Yeah, well, right. Anxiety is a big part of it. Anxiety lasts a long time. And when you go for your six month checkup, and then you have to wait another year and you go for your your checkup that lasts usually years. So you exhaust your friends, you exhaust your family, you feel tired of talking about it, tired of it being so much a part of your world. You don't want to talk to your family, you don't want to talk to your friends about it anymore. Uh -huh. But the reality is you still need the support. Uh -huh. So that's where the community as a whole comes in to be that third layer of support, whether it's through support groups or private therapy or just in general. But cancer has many layers to it. And without the foundation of a strong community, there's holes. You yeah. can't just rely on family and friends because they can't do it all. And I'm thinking about the motive that the community has. There's empathy, of right. course. There's altruism. There's the idea that, okay, this person is a part of our community. They need our help. But there's benefit to the community also, right? I mean, because... When someone is diagnosed with cancer, that affects not just their close circle of family and friends, but mm -hmm. their employers, others that depend on them. They're not as available to volunteer at school or in other right. organizations. The entire community is somehow affected. How would you sum it up if asked the question, what's in it for the community mm -hmm. to really get behind people who are struggling like this? I think it depends on your personal view of community and what it means to be a whole community and what a healthy community looks like. All really, really easy questions. We could just dispense with those in the next five minutes, right? <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> I mean, it really comes down to philosophical beliefs. How do we take care of each other and why is it important? And what I find most fascinating is we have seen a lot of these questions come up in our society. How do we take care of each other? Who are we as a culture? Um, where's our future of the United States of America, if we want to go sure. that big? Sure. But you can also like whittle it down to um, the Gunnison Valley. And we have a lot of change coming our way, whether we like it or not. The question is, who do we want to be? And what is our community going to look like? Absolutely and right. We can't stop things from happening to us. We can't stop cancer. You know, there's always ways we can be healthy, but cancer is not necessarily something we do to ourselves. It is part of our world. When mm -hmm. you're diagnosed with cancer, you can't change that. So from a community standpoint, how do we see ourselves as a community? And how does cancer affect our community when we have a lot of people affected by it? It's not just about the people who are giving to our community, but it's the people that that maybe can't afford or get to treatment. What does our community owe them? Why is it important to our community to make sure they have access to care? And I think it's a philosophical question. And if you read fables or stories about African communities, it's about working together. And it's about how we all have to take care of each other for us to be able to be a whole. So, right. I mean, it's, so it's not just about we're not a very good community in that moment. It's that we really start to lose the definition of what community is at all. That's what I believe. And that's why I do my job. Yeah. Yeah. I like that idea. And I like that you've brought it into the larger picture. Uh, you know, a lot of people look across the landscape of our country right now and, and see only chaos. But in chaos, there's, there's great opportunity. Mm -hmm. It points out things that are important decisions that we make individually and as a community. Are you seeing in our community evidence that we are facing these questions? 
Absolutely. I think the question is in in the coffee shops, um, when you're sitting there and people are talking about how are we going to change? Who do we want to be? Um, affordable housing, big conversation. You know, we have a lot happening in our community. We have a lot of opportunity. And I'll tell you what, we have a great foundation. I've lived many places. And Living Journeys is an organization that does not exist in all places. The foundation of why this organization exists is because of this community, because people created an organization that wanted to take care of those who had cancer. And what we are seeing is people donate to Living Journeys, and when they make that donation, they say, I believe that no one should be left alone facing cancer. And we live in a rural community, and we understand that that means We face greater challenges and longer distances to care and more loss of work because we're gone. And so that does not exist in most communities across the country. And you're saying the community itself doesn't have the level of empathy that you see here. Exactly. Uh, More than just empathy. I think there's empathy in other places. It's that this community rallies around each other. And it's not just about cancer. When you look at you know, people do fundraisers for each other all the time. We take care of each other. And I I think because we live in a harsh climate, I mean, that sounds crazy, but... <laughs> that, um, that goes to shoveling your neighbor's walk. Yes, and, it does. Uh, making sure their car starts. Right. We are a product of our environment and our environment is harsh. It's beautiful. It's magical, but it's harsh. Mm-hmm. I believe the Gunnison Valley shapes who we are as a community. And as a result, our community takes care of each other in a way that most places in our country have lost that. Mm. I want to say everywhere, but we still have that. And and we're always going to change. A hundred years from now, we're going to be changing. It's not that this is pivotal. We have a foundation that we don't want to lose. And we have it now. So if we hang on to it, we're going to thrive. We're going to be but great. But that's something you have to actively do. You can't just say, oh, we've got a great foundation. How cool for us. Yes. You have to work to preserve it. Right. Let me ask you this. How prevalent is cancer diagnosis in our community? That's a good question. It is predicted that 54 individuals that live in our community year-round residents will be diagnosed with cancer. So that's a, just a statistical it's, average. It's across. based on based on our population size and the average rate of cancer over the past 20 years. Um, believe it or not, That is just below the national average, and Gunnison County is the third lowest county. The state of Colorado, Gunnison County is the third lowest for cancer rates. And our types of cancer, in other words, breast cancer is the most common form of cancer or the most prevalent. About 30% of all cancer diagnoses are breast cancer. Nationwide. Nationwide, statewide, and in Gunnison County. Um, Prostate cancer and lung cancer, um, they're all in par. So, you know, I've had people say, what's going on when our water, it seems like so many people are getting cancer here. We just happen to know so many people. We are connected. We understand it. Um, But our water is clean and our environment is clean. And we are not like seeing cancer rates higher than than anywhere else. Which supports what you said earlier that cancer is just part of modern life. It is. It's really hard to pinpoint and say where it's coming from. But the fact is, it's here. Right. But 54 out of everyone that lives in Gunnison County, at first blush, you might think, well, that's kind of a small number. Mm -hmm. But when you really start to think about that, that means every time I go to the grocery store, there's a statistically significant Mm -hmm. chance that I'm standing there with one of those people. Mm -hmm. Once a week, someone we know might be diagnosed with cancer. 52 weeks in the year, 54 people diagnosed. And across all age groups, all demographics. Cancer does not discriminate against age. We have young children with cancer. It doesn't discriminate against wealth. We have very wealthy people diagnosed with cancer. We have very poor people diagnosed with cancer. Uh, It doesn't discriminate against uh, gender or race. So it is an equalizer. Cancer affects us all the same.
I'm going to challenge you a little bit, though, because yep. it can be an equalizer. But for those poor people, for instance, who lack access to resources, mm -hmm. they don't feel equal in their experience no. with somebody who does have access to the latest and best care. Right. Which brings us back around to an organization like Living Journeys. Mm -hmm. And according to you, there aren't that many. Right. But brings us back to Living Journeys. And what your mission is, is to be that element that does equalize, that does level the playing field as much as possible. Yes, we try. And we're trying harder. And we need to do more. I can give you two very prominent examples uh, in the last year or two. Some radiation therapies require you to have teeth removed before you can have the therapy. If you have some tooth decay and you need to have radiation in your head or your neck, you have to have teeth removed. If you're on Medicaid, we don't have a dentist in our valley that will remove your teeth. You have to go to Montrose as the closest Medicaid provider and they won't do the services until you pay up front. Well, how long do you think it might take somebody to earn on minimum wage the amount to pay up front? Um, we make sure that they can get a ride to Montrose, that we work directly with the provider. We become the insurance company in this case. We pay, they will then um, bill Medicaid, and then when they're reimbursed, they'll give whatever portions they're given, we get back. So living journeys in small doses. Now, unfortunately, a second situation, we couldn't be that insurance company because the costs were astronomical and we are working to build funds so that we can do more of this. Um, there was a client who was denied care for seven weeks, loss of limb, loss of life, and it had to do with an insurance issue, not being qualified for Medicare or Medicaid. Um, Gap Insurance denied the coverage after the radiation. Um, it was just, it was a nightmare. This story is, is horrifying. It's horrifying. People, because on yeah. top of a cancer diagnosis, then people have to enter this kind of, of gauntlet that they run. Yes. If you don't have money or you don't have a vehicle, or if you're uh, homeless, a cancer diagnosis means something very different. Well, so stepping in to that sort of nightmarish mess, Living Journeys has set the bar pretty high. I mean, 54 people, not all of them are going to need that level of intervention, no, but right. some of them do. Right. How in the world do you go about filling a need that is the system essentially stacked against the patient? Right. We're working closely. We have conversations with Health and Human Services. Um, when we have clients that are facing eviction because they haven't been able to work, because they're going through treatments and they're very sick, there are some services that we can partner with that are social services. Unfortunately, the qualifications for those services are very um that's a very defined qualifications. They're mm -hmm. in boxes. If you don't fit in that box, you're left right. left out. I will tell you right now, our greatest need and the people that need us most are our strong, young, 20 to 45-year-old population. They're the working class. They're the parents of our students in our schools. They're working three jobs sometimes. They're the strong. They're the ones that are supposed to be able to take care of themselves. Mm -hmm. When they're diagnosed with cancer, if it's a severe cancer or treatment takes them out of work, they've lost work. Their spouse, if they want to have a companion helping them, loses work too. Um, the children suffer. Or a family with a child diagnosed with cancer. Ages 20 to 45, working class, uh, there's no resources for them. So this goes back to the big picture question, the philosophical question. Right. Are we okay with that as a community? <laughs> Are we? Hey, that hasn't happened to me. Right. It stinks, but what can we do? Right. Are we okay with this? This is a big question. If you look in the paper right now, you can get a job doing just about anything. We need workers so badly, right? Right. How many of those jobs pay health benefits? Uh, I would not hazard a number, but it's not very many. Not very many. However, 
There are employers out there that are employing people who get put in these situations and they're allowing them leave of absences and making sure that they have some stipend work. And as small business owners, I praise that because I understand small businesses can't always afford to foot the bill of a cancer diagnosis sure. for an employee. But Which is why I was asking the question, what does it mean to a community yeah, as a whole? Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. And the answer that you're giving now suggests that everybody can do something. Yes. You can contribute in some way, whether it's an extra shift at work, whether it's, uh, you know, payment for lost time. Yep. You can donate your leave to a fellow employee who mm -hmm. has, so they can have a longer leave to be with family members. Yep. So it's a big hill to climb, but no one person or no one entity has to do it no. alone. No. That's the whole idea. Absolutely. Yeah. There are businesses that are helping, um, community members. Yeah. Well, yeah, the, yeah, the, yeah. The list could go on and on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to shift gears just a little bit. Yeah. And ask you, why this? For you personally. Why this work? Yeah. What gets you out of bed every morning, mm -hmm. motivated to go and throw yourself into this issue with mm -hmm. such passion? What's your story? Why does this matter to you? That's a good question. And I, uh, personally, what do you want to leave behind in your life? What do you want to accomplish? And I know I could make more money doing something else. I don't know what it would be. Um, and I struggle sometimes. We have family needs. But in the end, I really want to feel like at the end of the day, I've done something to help somebody else. And that's just maybe who I am. But um, I was affected by cancer, and we did not live here. And I had two young children, and they were one and three at that time. I was very lucky that my therapies and surgery were not as severe as others are. So I'm not claiming to say I've gone through this terrible thing, but I understand what anxiety is. I understand what fear is. I understand what being a mother is and having young children. Um, I also understand where your support comes from. And there were holes for me. And even though we had great insurance, my husband works for the federal government, we had great health insurance, the financial hit of a cancer diagnosis was mind numbing. Um, mm -hmm. For young adults with young kids, we didn't have huge amount of savings. We had, you know, threw things on credit cards, even, mm -hmm. even though we had great insurance, the expense is through the roof. So, um, I understand I have a lot of empathy for people who are in that situation. Right. And I also really have a little chip on my shoulder. And, um, <laughs> well, we, it would be shocking if you didn't. I have a chip on my shoulder. And the community that I lived in at that time, and I consider it the United States, we aren't doing enough. We weren't taking care of each other. We aren't doing enough. Well, that's Healthcare why I called it a issue. systemic problem. It is systemic. And I do believe and I feel that living journeys and the work that I do has an impact to fill some of the holes that our system is failing us. And when you make a donation to living journeys, what you're saying is, I want change. I want the little guy that doesn't have any money mm -hmm. to get the same treatment. And I want to give back to the philanthropist and the people who are running these nonprofits that are diagnosed with cancer. It's mm -hmm. our turn to say, thank you for giving to right. us. Let us help you. And that's where living journeys can fill these holes and these gaps where our our governments and our community as a country, we are not taking care of each other and our health system is broken and our medical system is broken. So it's a grassroots way to yeah. say, we're not going to wait for you anymore. Right. <laughs> we're right. we're going to get it done. It's my way of fighting back and saying, fine, if you won't do it, we will. Yeah. And I mean, I think that's why I keep going and it's not... Oh, it's there's nothing like a good fight to get you up in the morning. <laughs> Are other communities starting to notice what you're doing here? Um, a little bit, but not a lot, because not a lot of people know who we are. Ah. But they're starting. There's an organization in Denver that's really looking at what we're doing. Um, they do some similar things, but not in the same. They do grants, mm -hmm. um, but that's it. Um, not everyone in Gunnison County knows who we are. 
Well, let's and see if let's we can do something about that. that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I think as we're there's no organization like this in Mesa County, Grand Junction, Montrose, Telluride, um, but we're beginning to have discussions about how we can uh, share resources, whether it's for transportation, and I think in working. It'll probably start Western Slope. In larger discussions, people will learn about what we're doing. And I think, yeah, they're going to see an organization that's making differences. Yep. Where hospitals can't anymore. Hospitals can't do what we're doing anymore, and they used to do it. And that's for financial reasons? Um, I really, Mostly? Yeah. um, An organization called Project Hope in Denver... um, has been working with a lot of the hospitals in Denver where they have oncology nurse navigators. We're very fortunate to have a fantastic oncology nurse navigator here at Gunnison Valley Health, but they're removing those positions mm. in Denver. Um, there is what, you know, that's being reported to me that these softer services are being lost because of financial. The way insurance is structured, yeah, all the, of that. We don't same have yeah. mess. Right. Darcy, how do people find you? You say, you know, a lot of people in Gunnison Valley don't even know you're here. Right. Where do they go to, to learn more right. about what you're up to? Well, hopefully if they've been diagnosed with cancer, their doctors are going to tell them about us. Um, we're really trying to get that. And most doctors now in, in our valley know about us. Mm-hmm. Not everyone's diagnosed here. So we're getting more and more referrals for Gunnison Valley Hospital. But we do have a website. It's livingjourneys.org. And you can always contact us through the website. Call us. Um, there's a phone number on the website. And um, I think we have to do a better job of outreach. We need to make sure nobody doesn't know about us. Mm-hmm. We need everyone that's diagnosed with cancer to know that we are here. And if there's a way we can help, we will do our best to, to be that resource. And there again, this is a community project. Right. If you're listening to this and you know somebody who's been diagnosed who does not know about Living Journeys, pick up the phone. Get on the website and, and figure it out and pass the word around. That would be great. All right. Darcy, thanks for joining me. Thank you. Thank you for having and me. And for all your hard work. Thank you. Think Radio is a production of Alan Mortis Media. To contact Alan, visit alanwardismedia.com. The show's producer is Issa Forrest. Original music by Issa Forrest. Join us next week for another great conversation on Think Radio.